In this series, we're going to be looking over some of the lesser known cards that would probably never appear in one of my other types of videos, or just talk about them in different ways than you might expect. The first card, or cards that are going to be in this video, are the Cosmo Archetype. The archetype is composed of a combination of dark and light monsters that are either psychic or machine type. The reason why I bring up this archetype is that the entire archetype is based off of two really popular pop culture franchises, Star Wars and The Wizard of Oz. And all of the cards are full references to these movies. So let's start with the spaceships of the Cosmo archetype. For the sake of not repeating the same line over and over, all spaceship monsters are both dark attribute and machine type. Each of them also have two effects, and the second effect being an archetypal one which are all floating effects that if it's destroyed by battle or card effect and sent to the graveyard, you can either add a lower level Cosmo monster to your hand from your deck or special summon it. Also, it's worth mentioning too that the highest four level monsters of the Cosmo archetype being Forerunner, Dark Destroyer, Dark Eclipse, and Dark Planet all can't be targeted by card effects. But let's get into the specifics. The big bad of the Cosmos is Cosmo Dark Planet. This is the highest level Cosmo monster at level 10 and has a whopping 4,000 attack and defense. Dark Planet also has the effect that it can only be special summoned by banishing Cosmo monsters at levels equals 10 or more. Also, it has the effect of negating the activation of a spell card at the cost of banishing another Cosmo monster from your graveyard. Aside from its effect, it's pretty clear what this monster is based off of. Dark Planet, of course, is based off the antagonist's base of operation, and in terms of the franchises, it's Star Wars Death Star and the Wicked Witch's Castle. Although Dark Planet really leans more towards the Star Wars side of things, there are still a couple of nods to the castle. Mainly the parapet, which is a short extension that normally goes around towers to provide cover while still having openings for scouting. Going a level lower at level 9 is Cosmo Dark Eclipse. This Cosmo monster has 3000 attack and 2600 defense. This is almost like a younger sibling card to the Dark Planet. As Dark Planet negates spells, Dark Eclipse negates trap cards in the same way, by banishing another Cosmo monster from your graveyard. Dark Eclipse was also the first of the machine Cosmo monsters to rather than special summon another lower level Cosmo monster, but to add it to your hand instead. Now, Dark Eclipse leans a lot more towards the Star Wars side of thing than Wizard of Oz. This is mainly with its design that is more a combination of Star Wars Eclipse class Dreadnought ship and Star Destroyer. This is pretty apparent with the shape and overall design of the ship, with both the triangular shape and the top half of the ship coming out. Next up is Cosmo Dark Destroyer, and arguably the most popular of the Cosmo machines. This is a level 8 machine Cosmo monster with 3000 attack and 1800 defense. And unlike Dark Planet or Dark Eclipse, rather than negating, when a destroyer is summoned, it can destroy one monster on the field. And why it's the most popular Cosmo machine is because of this effect. Because the lower level Cosmos, or their quote unquote pilots of the machines of the Cosmo archetype all have the effect to banish themselves as special summon a higher level Cosmos at quick effect, so most of the time they'll be bringing out Dark Destroyer during your opponent's turn in order to interrupt their plays by destroying a monster with its effect. And Dark Destroyer actually got limited because of this at one point, because of how good the effect was. Because yes, the destruction effect was good, but paired with a floating effect of special summon from the deck, being untargetable, having good stats, and how easy the rest of the archetype was at recycling it, it was limited. Anywho, in terms of inspiration, Dark Destroyer takes its main tools of transportation of the antagonist of each series. That being the flying broomstick of the Wizard of Oz and the Scimitar Sith Infiltrator. Like Dark Planet and the other machine types of the archetype, it's hard to see the Wizard of Oz inspiration here. But don't worry, as we get into the pilots, it'll become a lot more clearer. The next three Cosmo machines are Cosmo Delta Shuttle, Cosmo Forerunner, and Cosmo Dogfighter. These last three are a lot more tame in terms of effects as the other Cosmo machines, but are all somewhat relevant to their archetype. Forerunner is the highest of them at level 7, then Dogfighter is at 6, and the last is Delta Shuttle at 5. Forerunner is the last of the machine Cosmos that can't be targeted and has the effect that during each of your standby phases you gain 1000 life points. Which at first isn't the best effect by comparison, but the lower level archetypal monsters using their effects cost 500 to 1000 life points for their effects. So Forerunner actually works pretty decent, on top of its floating effect of special summon lower level Cosmos when it's sent to the graveyard. Dogfighter on each standby phase special summons a token that's essentially a copy of itself, and the same stat line at 2000 attack and 2400 defense, which is decent enough for extra deck plays or getting extra bodies on the field. Then last is Delta Shuttle that can send a Cosmo from the deck to the graveyard and the monster loses attack and defense equal to its level. But its real use if Delta Shuttle is used at all in Cosmo decks is just because it's a free foolish burial. In terms of inspiration, there's the plethora of ships from Star Wars that each of the aforementioned take after, like the TIE Fighter, the V-19 Torrent, and the Millennium Falcon, and for the Wizard of Oz references, the ships take from the Wild Crow, the Wolf, who are all characters in the extended story of Wizard of Oz. Before we get to the other half of the Cosmo monsters, there are three other Cosmo cards that we should bring up. The field spell Cosmotown, the equip card Cosmo Light Sword, and the trap card Cosmojo. Each of the three reference both franchises, starting with Cosmojo, which is the archetypal trap card that destroys one Cosmo monster you control and non-target banishes a card your opponent controls. Cosmojo is a pretty powerful archetypal trap card, especially since it procs the floating effects of the high level Cosmo machines. With the artwork, the card references the iconic magical force of Star Wars and the magic or sorcery of the Wizard of Oz. 
The artwork specifically references the Force Choke Maneuver, which is essentially using the Force to choke or strangle a victim. Next up is Cosmo Light Sword, which is an equipped card for psychic Cosmo monsters that lets it gain 500 attack and defense, piercing damage, and an additional attack. But the effect of Light Sword doesn't matter too much, the artwork is what matters in this case. The card is referencing the Weapon of the Jedi, a lightsaber, and on the Wizard of Oz side, wands, which are the main weapons of the witches of the franchise. If you take a close look, the weapon of the character in the middle, the weapon is a combination of the iconic double-bladed lightsaber, but also it has two gems in the hilt, akin to magic wands that channel their energy through a similar crystal on the hilt of the wand. Last is Cosmotown, the archetypal field spell. The field spell has three phenomenal effects and is an essential part to the archetype. The first effect is that once per turn you can add back to your hand one of your banished Cosmo monsters, but you take life point damage equal to its level times 100. The second is that you can essentially recycle your hand if you break. It allows you to reveal any number of Cosmo monsters from your hand, shuffle them back into their deck, and then draw an equal amount of cards. Then the last effect, on top of both of those, is that if Cosmo Town is destroyed, then you can add any Cosmo card from your deck to your hand. This includes another Cosmo Town too, so you don't need to worry too much if the key card is gone. Cosmo Town is based both on Star Wars Coruscant and the Emerald City in The Wizard of Oz. Although nothing really screams Emerald Town and Cosmo Town, the Japanese name really makes the connection. The Japanese name of Cosmo Town is Emeraldopolis, which really fits with the Wizard of Oz theme. But now onto the more Wizard of Oz side of things, the pilots. They're all level 4 and below, and except for one case, psychic type monsters. With these monsters, you'll see a lot more onto the Wizard of Oz inspirations, but still in the realm of Star Wars. There are a total of 8 different pilot monsters, all with similar effects like the ships. They all have the effect to banish themselves to special summon a higher level Cosmo monster from your hand, as well as their own original effect. To start the pilots, let's talk about the main character of the Cosmo story, Cosmo Farm Girl and Cosmo Dark Lady. Both are psychic monsters and have the same previously mentioned archetypal effect, but their own pretty strong effects that make them key members of the archetype. On battle damage, Farm Girl can add another Cosmo monster from your deck to your hand. Although the effect is good, the mere 1500 attack points makes using the effect a bit challenging. Regardless, Farm Girl is an important part of the main characters of the Cosmos, and this is seen with the design drawing inspiration mainly from Dorothy from Wizard of Oz with the iconic red hair and her dog Toto in the background, but Farm Girl is a lot more mechanical. There's also nods to Luke Skywalker from Star Wars, but that's mainly from the desert setting and the attire that the Farm Girl wears. Interestingly enough, both characters come from farms, so the name is a nod to both Dorothy's time on her family farm and Luke's time on his uncle's moisture farm. On the other end is Cosmo Dark Lady, which is the Dark Vader slash Wicked Witch of the West combination. She has the effect to negate the activation of a monster effect and destroy it for the cost of 1000 life points, and is the only psychic type Cosmo monster to be above level 4. This was the one exception I was talking about. Design wise too, there isn't much left to the imagination. With the iconic dark robes of both characters, mask representing Vader, and the witch hat for the Witch of the West, and the purple light sword to tie it all together. The last thing about the Cosmo archetype that I want to bring up is the companion trio of the Cosmos. Cosmo Tin Can, Cosmo Straw Man, and Cosmo Scaredy Lion. These three monsters are level 1 and 2, with Tin Can being the only level 1 and serves as an important part of the Cosmo archetype. On top of the pilot monster's effects to banish itself and special summon a high level monster, they each have strong unique effects. Tin Can allows you for 500 life points at the end of your turn to pick 3 different Cosmo monsters from your deck and your opponent lets you add one of them to your hand. Straw Man, for the cost of 500 life points, can special summon a banished Cosmo monster, but its effects are negated and it's destroyed near the end phase. Lastly, Scaredy Lion, for 500 life points, lets you recycle 3 banished Cosmo monsters and move them back to the graveyard. Now, all three of these cards are the main companions of the Cosmo Farm Girl and their inspiration equivalents. Tin Can is based on both R2-D2 and the Tin Man from the respective franchises. Straw Man is based obviously 3PO and the Scarecrow, and last is Scaredy Lion, which is based off of Chewbacca and the Cowardly Lion. In short, these characters are the best friends and companions of the protagonists, and their effects showcase their archetypal importance. The Cosmo archetype as a whole is really interesting in their design choices. Combining two well-loved franchises and making a pretty viable archetype is nothing to scoff at. The duality of the ship monsters drawing their main inspiration from Star Wars, and the pilots and the Wizard of Oz really make the archetype feel balanced in its design. And I can only hope to see more cool pop culture referencing archetypes in the future. Next up is Number C-1000, Numeronius. This is a rank 12 light fiend type monster with question mark attack and defense. Numeronius requires 5 level 12 monsters, which is quite the outrageous summoning requirement. However, most of the time you'll be cheating it out with Numeron Chaos Ritual. Numeronius has the effect where, at the end of the battle phase, you can destroy all monsters your opponent controls and then special summon one of them to your side of the field in defense position. It also has a quick effect to detach and destroy one of the monsters of the field and can float into number IC1000, Numeronius, Numeronia, on its destruction by an opponent's card effect while it has a material and then attach itself to that monster as one of its materials. But what makes this card interesting is that Numeronius is part of a pretty common archetype that any Master Duel player will know very well. That archetype being Numerons. This is mainly because of just the four basic Numeron gates, normally either win you or lose the duel on the turn that they're summoned because you can swing for a game with just the four XC monsters alone. 
so in most cases it's not too worth bothering with the other Numeron cards. But despite this, Numeronius and its evolutions are quite the anime final battle level of Flashy. Now, kind of like the Cosmo cards, Numeronius comes from a different world. In that, the person who uses it is Don Thousand. And unlike the Cosmos, who are pretty tame, Don Thousand, not so much. According to the Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexal lore, he's from another world and he wants to bring about chaos. And in true anime fashion, in the duel, Numeronius is defeated by a combination of using ZS Ouroboros' Sage Effect to equip both it and number C39 Utopia Ray Victory to number 101 Silent Honor Arc to boost its attack to 11,000 when it attacks into Numeronius, which has 10,000 attack in the anime. Although this strategy in theory worked, it didn't fully destroy Numeronius for plot reasons. It was then destroyed by the extra effective Numeron Dragon, that when it's destroyed you can destroy as many other monsters on the field. However, with the destruction of Numeronius, things got worse as the true boss monster came into play. Number IC1000 Numeronius Numeronia. This mouthful of a monster is a rank 13 light fiend monster that has the impossible summon requirement of 5 level 13 monsters. And I say impossible because level 13 doesn't exist in standard Yu-Gi-Oh! And you'd have to use level modulation effects to even get a monster to level 13. But the true way to summon it is just to cheat out of the extra deck when Numeronius is destroyed. So you summon Numeronia and attach Numeronius as one of its materials. And its effect is, on your opponent's turn, Numeronia gains 100,000 attack and defense and has one active effect and two passives. The passive effects are that monsters your opponent controls must attack Numeronia if possible, so as long as they are in defense position or equipped with something like a fog blade. And at the end of your opponent's turn, if Numeronia didn't battle, then you win the duel. Then there's the active effect of Numeronia, that when opponent's monster declares an attack, you can detach a material to negate the attack and gain life points equal to that monster's attack. And with the rules of Yu-Gi-Oh, if the attack is negated through this effect, then Numeronia doesn't actually do battle so the instant wind effect does in fact activate. In terms of anime ultimate villain monsters, Numeronia does a pretty good job, because in just reading the effects, it seems like quite the insurmountable wall. Maybe except for the fact that it has no real protection, so you can easily get rid of it with something like a Regeki or any other removal effect that just kind of breathes on it. But of course, no anime protagonist deck runs cards like that because it would make things too easy. The way Dawn Thousand's boss monster was defeated was through the use of Double or Nothing, and a bunch of other cards that boosted Utopia's attack points all the way up to 204,000 points for a clean attack that not only wiped out Dawn Thousand, but his remaining 102,900 life points. Yeah, this duel, like all final duels in the Yugo anime, got a bit out of hand to say the least. But alas, the main characters always find a way to beat the odds and come out on top. We are going to freeze to death, unless we call for help. How does your phone look? My phone has enough power for about a 20 minute YouTube video. Thank goodness you have internet. Quick call for help. Oh, no can do. This is just a video downloaded from the Dexlog's YouTube channel for offline viewing. There's no service out here. Wow. Did you know that players could use Reset Stamp to completely discard their opponent's hand with a combination of just a few other cards? And the combo was consistent, too. Yu-Gi-Oh! doesn't have any kind of hand disruption on this level. We are going to freeze to death. We don't have time to watch a video about the Pokemon TCG. But you don't understand. Even in the early days of the game, one of the best item cards was one that simply returned a Pokemon to your hand. Can you believe that? Wait, really? How is bouncing your own monster that beneficial? Just watch the rest of the video with me to find out. We're ghosts. We can't die anyway.